For this video, I wanted to try something I've never done before and review every game I played in 2019, including games that didn't come out in 2019, but I didn't get around to until playing this year. This will include games on the original Xbox, the 360, PS3, PS4, PSVR, PS Vita, and PC. I'll only be talking about the story modes in these games as reviewing the multiplayer is a whole other beast, maybe for another video, so when you see a score you don't like for a more multiplayer focused game like Call of Duty, it will only be based on the campaigns of the game, not the multiplayer. The rules are pretty simple, I get 60 seconds to review each game and at the end of each review I'll put a score out of 10. If you want to see all the games I beat since 2009, not including the PSP or PS2, which I never got around to logging, go to my howlongtobeat.com profile, link in the description. Alright then, let's go. You finally arrived. Dusk is a badass first person shooter that takes all the best elements of late 90s shooters and puts them into one great throwback FPS. Now, I didn't grow up playing 90s first person shooters, so I don't have the nostalgia that a lot of people have for these types of shooters, but it doesn't mean I don't love a lot of what this game has to offer. It has this awesome, almost like pseudo horror vibe that has you fighting everything from the occult to Russian forces and everything in between. The shooting feels great and every weapon feels unique and packing a hell of a punch whenever one gives an enemy into dozens of tiny pieces. And I have to say that it's one of the smoothest, best controlling games I think I've actually ever played on PC. And on top of that, it has one of the best soundtracks I've ever heard in a game with composer Andrew Hasholt, I think, mixing th synths and metal to offer music that reminds me of Doom 2016's great soundtrack. The only real issue I have with the game is that towards the end it does get a bit repetitive and I feel that it may have outstayed its welcome just a bit, but I highly recommend it to anyone who's a fan of 90s first person shooters or just first person shooters in general. <laughs> Let a single one get away. Now, I have to make a quick confession with this one. It's my first Smash Brothers. I know, it's crazy, but I was always a PlayStation guy exclusively, basically until I got my Switch in 2017. So, now I finally played it, and what I'm reviewing here is the story mode or the World of Light. I'm nowhere near good enough to get into the meta and review any of that, or any of the multiplayer. So, this is really just my first Smash Brothers story. It's fine. <laughs> As a campaign for a fighting game, it's really not all that great and way too long at around 29 hours to beat for me. And it's really just you going from tile to tile, fighting random enemies and their assist spirits, and there's really not much else there. And it could be really, really easy at times, with loading times actually taking longer than the fights themselves. And now the moment-to-moment -moment fighting mechanics are great, and I'll, I'll definitely give them that there. But playing through the story mode probably really isn't worth it. And I think I'd really just recommend playing against other people as it's just really boring and way too long. Now this is a game that took me by surprise. Donut County is basically Katamari Damacy with holes instead of balls. You control a raccoon trying to deliver donuts to people across the Donut County to win a quadcopter as your big prize, but it turns out you're actually making giant holes that get larger as they swallow the residents of Donut County up. I'm not going to spoil anything here, but this might just be one of the most charming games I think I've ever played besides maybe Katamari Damacy or Jetamaro, and I loved every second of it. All the characters have these really fun, quirky personalities that help them make the world feel much more fun to be part of, really. The art style is simple yet endearing, looking very similar to like Untitled Goose Game in its low poly aesthetic. Now, it only took me about 90 minutes to complete, which is probably its biggest downside, but it is 90 minutes that is filled with some genuinely funny moments that actually made me laugh out loud, and that's something I can't say of many other games, and it has a simple yet uh, engaging puzzles. Now, there's not much else to say, so anyone looking for a short but sweet puzzle game should, that isn't too challenging should definitely give this one a look. I thought I knew why I came here. I saw it. The end. 
Now this is a hard game to review as it's definitely not bad by any means and it's actually pretty good but it just feels a bit uninspired in many aspects. I don't really have any fond memories of playing the game. Sitting here writing this review, the whole game all kind of just blends together and there's no point that I remember that were that bad but there's not that much here that's all that great either. Uh, there's really everything here you have seen in other games and it's just done better there. This is definitely the weakest in the franchise, and I feel the rebooted Tomb Raider series got worse as it went along, and it never got bad, it was just good. The best thing I could say about the game are the visuals and stealth in the jungle. It is really a beautiful game, and when you're slinking around the jungle, covered in mud, killing bad guys from the shadows, it can be really fun, and it sort of makes you feel like the Predator. But other than that, there's really not that all that much special here. The shooting really isn't all that great, and I really have always hated the way the camera zooms in on Laura when shooting, but that's been the case with every game in the rebooted series. So if you really love Tomb Raider, and you probably already played this one, and if you haven't, play the 2013 Tomb Raider and Rise of the Tomb Raider first. Let me start this one off by saying that Forza Horizon is probably my favorite racing series right now. It mixes arcade and sim racing elements in a beautiful open world to create one of the best racing series out now. I've played all of them except the first at this point, and I wouldn't say this is my favorite one in the series. That probably goes to Forza Horizon 3, but this is still a great racing game. The British location with the different seasons is a nice addition to the formula with each season playing slightly differently, but not too different from the other seasons. And if you're struggling on a race in one season, maybe waiting to the next season would be worth it. The only downsides of the game really are the microtransactions, and there's a lot of them, and that it really doesn't involve the series all that much. The microtransactions are really just kind of dumb with you being awarded with things like hats and other clothing that you don't even really see, so there's no real point. But if you can ignore these and haven't played the series before, this is a great one to jump into. I just really hope the next game in the series evolves the formula a bit more because for as much as I love this series, I think I can only take so much of the same game in a different environment. I actually bought this game in about 2014 or 2015 and only got around to it this year after hearing about Metro Exodus coming out. I really enjoy linear atmospheric first person shooter games and Metro is definitely one of the better ones out there. It has a bleak world that feels lived in with awesome weapon design that makes most of the guns feel cobbled together with some screws and scotch tape. It has some truly awesome weapon design and I can't think of a weapon that I didn't love even if it was just for its gnarly looks. The shooting in Metro Last Light is probably the best part and I just wish there was more of it. A lot of the game is almost like a walking simulator where you just follow people around and listen to them talk. And that for me is the biggest weakness in the game, that there isn't as much game as I'd like. I do love scurrying around dark corridors in the metro looking for just enough ammunition to get by and blasting all manners of disgusting creatures with surprisingly fun gameplay, but there just isn't enough of it. And the story here is fine, but nothing all that memorable. The best aspect of the story is the world and how real and lived in it feels. I have the book but never got around to reading it, so I can't say how true it is to the source material, but if you love atmospheric first one shooters like Bioshock, then definitely look into this one. is not behind you. It is ahead. The droid. I'll pay for him. Actually, the droids are not for sale. The original LEGO Star Wars and LEGO Star Wars 2, the original trilogy, were some of my favorite games growing up. I played them to death at my friend's house, and when I finally got my own PlayStation 2, it was the first game I got at Toys R Us. So, the LEGO Star Wars series has a lot of sentimental value attached to it for me, and this game is a pretty good modern version of the LEGO games. If you've played a LEGO game before, you know exactly what to expect with a couple new additions. There's side missions and interplanetary travel, and a terrible new third-person cover mechanic that inexplicably uses the left thumbstick to aim. 
My favorite new addition has to be the Starship Combat. Yeah, it's mostly on rails, but it does feel pretty good for what it is. But other than that, there really isn't much to say here. If you like Star Wars and Lego games, you'll like this one. And if you don't like either of those, you won't like this. It's simply yet fun to play couch co-op with someone who doesn't have much experience with video games, like a child or significant other. The controls and puzzles are simple, and it's some light fun for players of all skill level. My biggest issue with the game is that I just really don't care that much for the sequel trilogy. But if you do, you might get more out of it than me. I'm in charge now. It's about time you showed up. Give it everything you got! You're afraid. But you will never be as strong as Darth Vader. Just a quick heads up on this one, the footage looks terrible because there aren't any high-res trailers out for the game and I didn't want to take someone else's footage. Now for the second worst game I've played this year, and I really wanted to like this one too. There aren't many Star Wars Flight games out now, and this one's available on Xbox One back compat. It starts out fine enough with you piloting a Jedi Starfighter in the middle of space, but once you get to the real first mission, the issues rear their ugly heads. Like many games of this era, there are no mid-mission checkpoints, so if you die in the middle of a mission, you start the whole thing over again. And this is quite frustrating in longer levels where you're dying at the end of a mission, and yeah, it's just so rage inducing. The game's biggest issue is that it's just so boring in every aspect from the gameplay to the story to the visuals. And I know it came out in 2002, but all the levels are so visually boring. There's some fun to be had here when you're not dying and you can play in split screen, which is great. But unless you're dying to play a Star Wars ship comic game and only have an Xbox One, I'd recommend many other games first. The only part of the game I really liked is that if you complete certain objectives and specific missions, you can get access to other playable ships like the Slave One or TIE Fighter. But after beating the game, I had no desire to go back. Nice work, Master Gallia. Thank you. I've completed my mission. While I do enjoy playing racing games, I won't pretend to be any aficionado, I don't play on the hardest difficulties, and I don't have a souped up racing set. I just occasionally like to play racing games with my controller and have some fun. Now before I say anything else, to complete the campaign of this game, you need to beat 475 races. Oof. I started this game in 2017 and didn't get around to beating it this year, and it drove me absolutely mad. If this game was maybe 100 races long, I think I'd add an extra two points, but it greatly outstays its welcome. It has killer driving mechanics and makes you feel like an actual rally car racer. And when driving in real life, I'd pretend that I had a co-pilot telling me all the directions and I was going for the best time. One of the reasons this drags on so much is that the game randomly generates tracks. It sounds good in theory that just about every track would feel unique, but in reality you'll be driving down the same dirt road over and over again. You'll go around one corner and realize you just drove down that exact same corner 30 seconds ago. It makes you feel like you're constantly racing on the same track over and over again and it bogs down an otherwise great racer. each other a long time. Another first game for me in a long running series. I only technically played a bit of DMC, but nonetheless I enjoyed this game, but not as much as seemingly everyone else. It's not that I didn't like it, I did, just not as much as everyone else. Devil May Cry 5 is a pretty standard third person hack and slash game with you cutting and slicing your way through hundreds of enemies, each with their own strengths and weaknesses. You play as three heroes here. Dante and Nero, who play like your standard third person hack and slash, and V, a unique take on the genre, who takes command of these otherworldly creatures to do the fighting for him. This game is really beautiful and runs at 60 FPS on PS4 Pro, which is great from a technical standpoint. From a gameplay perspective, the game is fun and the combat feels visceral, but there was just something there that I can't put my finger on, like the fighting felt a bit off. From a story perspective, you'd get much more if you played the previous games. Looking back at it now, I can't really tell you anything about the story because I just don't remember it all that much, other than we're fighting some big bad menacing dude who wants to take over the world. Now, I know it's not the best explanation to why I don't like the game more, but I still recommend this game to fans of hack and slash games. Pro at smacking demons around. That's why I built him that well functioning arm <laughs> to kick demon ass.
With L.A. Noir, Team Bondi and Rockstar Games set out to create a unique crime thriller that explores what it means to be a detective in Hollywood's golden age. Before I go any further, if you're going to play this, don't play it on Switch. The game is kind of a technical mess on the Switch with lackluster frame rate, awful popping, and a lot of glitches. The score I'm going to give at the end is for the Switch version of the game, and if you play it basically anywhere else, add a point and a half to the score. L.A. Noir is not like any game I've ever played before. The writing and acting in most of the gameplay are a level above just about every game I've ever played. The game took an extremely long time to make, and I think the results speak for themselves. It's an enthralling game that uses detective mechanics like I've never seen before. Reading suspects' faces and examining clues to determine who committed crimes are all great mechanics. The only really problem here I have with the story is how some of the cases don't seem to add to the greater story of Cole Phelps. I don't even think... They were trying to make these add to the story because of how the DLC cases are just thrown in the middle of the game if you have the definitive edition. The only issues with the mechanics are the driving and shooting, which to be frank are pretty bad and weren't good when they came out, and definitely not up to any standard of today. If you want a detective game that actually makes you think when you play and makes you work to get a good score at the end of each case, then this game is a must buy considering there's literally no other game to write the wrongs committed during this time in the war. You look spooked, Phelps. It never gets any easier, Bukowski. Phelps works to rise through the ranks of the LAPD, starting in patrol as a beat cop. The original Little Boy Planet was an important game for me as one of the first games I got for my PS3 in middle school. I loved creating levels and playing with a friend, even if the actual platforming wasn't the best in the world, and the levels I made were total trash when going back to play them. Little Big Planet 3 is a departure for the series in that it has been developed by Sumo Digital and not Media Molecule since they were, and still are, working on Dreams. It's hard to call this game a disappointment when I didn't expect much from it from the first place, but I have to admit, I did expect a little bit more. Maybe I'm wearing nostalgia glasses, but this seems like very little has actually changed in the third installment. Now there are some new characters to play as, with new mechanics like a large character, a bird, and a dog, but they don't really change the gameplay up all that much. It can be fun with a friend and couch co-op, and as all the levels and this one are surprisingly hard in certain sections, which I didn't expect at all. Some levels had me trying over and over again, and that possibly had to do with the person I was playing with not having much gaming experience. But still, for a game marketed at a younger demographic, this has some brutal stages. This is your standard two safe sequel that doesn't add too much to the formula and is only recommended for diehard fans. Welcome aboard. So-called walking simulators aren't really my cup of tea with a few exceptions like Firewatch and Gone Home. I prefer a mix of kinetic gameplay and an interesting story in my games and this genre doesn't really offer that. However, I did enjoy my time with this game even if I don't think it's as good as the developer's last game, Gone Home. This game takes place on board an abandoned spaceship and it's your job to figure out what happened by looking for clues and to watch these hologram recordings of the lost crew from the ship. I won't spoil the game any more than that, but it is a fairly enjoyable time with you walking around a visually striking spaceship and listening to some quality voice acting and writing. The game covers a wide variety of topics, such as relationships, AI, and corporations. It does all these serviceably, and the acting really elevates a lot of the writing. The game is visually very impressive too, and I loved exploring the ship and looking out into space. To see the other parts of the ship, it is really a sight to behold and reminds me of Alien and Isolation in some regards. The game is very short though, only taking me about an hour and a half to beat, and at $20 I wouldn't say it's worth it, unless there's a sale going Going on. Together. That's what matters. I didn't think things would end like this. This is the second physics-based platform I've played this year from Somo Digital, and it's definitely a unique one. You play as a snake, as the title suggests, solving platforming puzzles to collect enough pieces to finish the level. The concept is simple enough, but the use of a snake as a playable character is what really makes this game special. As opposed to other games in the genre, you can't just jump from platform to platform. Here you have to curl your snake's body around obstacles like stones and bamboo to cross bridges and death traps. 
With a snake, you have to think much more differently. And to be successful, you have to think like a snake. When moving on a flat surface, that means moving left to right to get the right grip like a snake would. Otherwise, you'll be moving slowly straight ahead. And when going over the aforementioned death traps, you'll have to make sure you're tight enough to hold on to something but loose enough to grab onto the next obstacle. The game looks quite pretty too, with not having most advanced lighting or textures or anything like that, but it's still being a pleasure to look at with its charming art style. The only real issue here I have is with the difficulty spikes, which can get quite frustrating when you have to maneuver over lava pits where you can easily fall in, and with some poorly spaced checkpoints. The game's music too is kind of forgettable, and it's just your average upbeat platforming tunes. At 20 bucks, it's a bit pricey, so maybe wait for a sale. I can't pretend to be the world's biggest looter shooter fan, I much prefer linear narrative focused FPS games over killing thousands of enemies and looking for loot, but Borderlands 2 is definitely one of the better looter shooters I've played. I actually started this game back in 2013 and didn't realize I only had like one mission left to beat until this year. At this point, most of you watching have already probably played it since it sold 13 million copies, but for the uninitiated, it's a colorful and wacky FPS where the goal is to kill as many enemies as possible, with the most meta weapons possible so you can earn more and better loot to kill even more enemies. It's a pretty fun loop and the dialogue keeps it going along with it actually being a pretty funny game which is not seen in gaming as a whole. While the tackling of bazillions of guns isn't the most accurate thing, as a lot of the guns are very similar with different stats and modifiers, there's still a lot to play around with. It's not the tightest shooting mechanics of all time, and the guns can feel a bit loose for my liking, but it's fun to put on a podcast and kill as many enemies as possible. The biggest downside, as many others have said, is the driving mechanics, which are absolutely terrible, and it's a chore to complete any mission where they're needed. Still, if you haven't picked this game up yet, you can get it with all the DLC for dirt cheap. It's unquestionably a fun experience by yourself or with friends. presents an Avalanche Studios production. Just Cause 3. Just Cause 3 is kind of infamous on PC for its really poor performance, which is absolutely horrible. On an i5 6600K and a 1070, I couldn't hit 1080p 60fps on medium settings. I had to end up settling for 30fps because it's just too variable otherwise. And the PS4 and Xbox One versions aren't much better and frequently drop to the mid-20s. So, if you could deal with the performance, what you are getting is a beautiful, generic, third-person open-world shooter in an open-world map that's just too big for its own good. There are tons of icons on the map to check off, and they're nearly all identical. If you've literally played any of the sequels or prequels, you've played this game. And I would recommend playing at least one of the games, preferably 2, 3, or 4, because they are crazy chaotic fun at times, with gorgeous explosions going off all over the place as you wreak havoc on a Mediterranean island. In terms of substance, though, there's not much here, and most of the missions are the same if you go into a location of blowing everything up. Now, this is not to say it's not fun, it's just a bit repetitive and shallow, and there isn't much strategy at all, and it's all kind of mindless junk food. Just causes the kind of game you want to play after a long day at work and don't really want to think hard about what to do and just look at some cool explosions. Rico, driven by the desire to return Medici to its once beautiful and peaceful past, goes about bringing down B. Rebello's armies and military bases by any means possible. I'm reviewing both ports of the PS Vita version at the same time here because they're very similar and I play them shortly after one another. So now, 60 seconds for two games and I'm already wasting time. I need to say outright these may be some of the worst ports of a game I've ever seen. Both games have horrible frame rates, way worse than PS2, terribly compressed audio that sounds like a bootleg copy of a movie, and the most sluggish menus I've ever used. Oh, and also, stretched UI which just looks plain ugly. These are the worst ways to play these games, even with the Vita being more powerful than the PS2. I would recommend playing it there over this sad excuse for a port. Now, assuming you can get past all that garbage, what you have here is an amazing hack and slash game that was truly amazing for its time, and still holds up from a gameplay's perspective all these years later. The combat is visceral as all hell, and still manages to shock with its depiction 
depictions of violence. The story here is pretty good, if a bit simple. You play as Kratos as you go on his, a quest to kill Ares in the first game and Zeus in the second, and anyone unlucky enough to get in his way. While it is a fun ride, Kratos is a one-note character and basically only has one emotion, anger. The only real downside to this game from a mechanic standpoint is the puzzles and platforming, which occasionally break up the combat and are pretty weak and mostly obnoxious. Highly recommended, but please play elsewhere. I am what the gods have made. I need to let y'all know that I'm Knight of Fighting Game Master. I like to play through the story modes of fighting games and then some play some towers or whatever the equivalent is. I basically have no experience with online fighting games, so I'm only reviewing the story here. And just like all Netherrealm games from MK9 onwards, it's really enjoyable. It feels like a high-budget popcorn movie with a fun but simple story that anyone can follow, some buff dudes kicking the shit out of each other, and a menacing villain. A lot of games have simple stories that are boring because of their simplicity, but with MK11 it's actually good and helps with the fun nature of the story. I won't spoil anything here, but it's enjoyable enough if you don't play fighting games, you could still get enjoyment from watching a let's play. As for the mechanics, speaking of someone who doesn't play fighting games much, it's what you'd expect, incredibly over the top gore, with you basically dissecting your opponents with your fists. And with every attack feeling heavy, and with a good sound system, you can basically feel each punch and kick as you eviscerate your enemies. The combat feels much slower than before, which I like because it made attacks feel more deliberate than in some other faster paced games. The biggest difference from other Mortal Kombat is how the meter is split up. Now you have a defensive and offensive bar that when fully charged can allow you to perform different actions such as meter burns and environmental interactions. I will destroy our enemies before they destroy us. Days Gone is a third-person open-world zombie shooter. Now, I know that sounds like just a bunch of buzzwords thrown together, and it kind of feels like that too, but I think it's more than the sum of its parts. The story in the game is probably the weakest element, with you playing as a biker, Deacon St. John, an unlikable anti-hero living in this post-apocalyptic world. Deacon is kind of a dick and not really all that interesting. He's not totally unlikable, but I would have preferred a much better character. Some of the side characters are more interesting than him, but generally speaking, most characters are not all that great, and the story doesn't really go anywhere all that interesting. Now, speaking of the gameplay, it gets much better. The shooting is fun, with tons of weapons to play with. The bike, the real main character of the game, is really fun to drive and feels just right as you upgrade it from a piece of garbage to a pretty killer bike in the end. The open world is also beautiful too, Northwestern America isn't seen in many games and it's done brilliantly here. The other unique element of the game are the hordes, which are just what they sound like, hundreds of freakers that take a lot of planning to dig down and are an actual threat if you're not careful. One more thing to note is how poor the performance is once the game's map opens up a bit more, dipping to the low 20s and actually making it a lot harder to play. If you enjoy third person open world games and zombies, this is a game to look into and has a lot to offer even with its myriad of issues. Riding through abandoned truck stops, small towns. This is an interesting release. It's a Treyarch developed expansion story to the amazing Call of Duty 2. And man, is it inferior to the base game by a lot. It basically has the same mechanics since it's on the same engine, but it's not nearly as fun as the original game. To be quite honest, I don't really remember much about the game other than that a lot of it took place on the African front, which is cool because that's a front rarely seen in any media. Actually, I actually had to look up some information just to make sure I was accurate with this review because of how forgettable it was. A highlight for me was seeing Mark Hamill do the voiceover for the in between mission footage, and this is something I do miss from old Call of Duties. They use real footage from the war and try at least a bit to make them historically accurate. The mechanics are mostly solid thanks to Call of Duty 2's base game, but it just feels uninspired and boring. It's everything you'd expect from a Call of Duty game with like large set pieces, but it doesn't really add to anything special. One thing that is different from other Call of Duty at the time was that the game is more narratively focused. In other COD you play as an unnamed soldier in a larger conflict, this game follows one shoulder. This does make you care more about the story than the previous games with some famous voice acting too. I still wouldn't say it's all that enthralling, but it was an interesting take. This is not a bad game, just a very average one.
to think that there's such thing as a decent movie game. We don't get many nowadays, and while most were bad, I do have to say I miss them a bit. Wanted Weapons of Fate doesn't really follow the movie, but instead expands on its story. It's a fun action movie with some really interesting shots, and sort of reminds me of John Wick and how it involves a secret society of assassins that is right under everyone's noses. To start this off, this is one of the shortest games I've played this year, with it taking a little over two and a half hours to complete, which is kind of funny because it's barely longer than the movie, but this is good because while the game's fun, there's not much gameplay diversity here. If it were any longer, it would have outstayed its welcome. So what are you doing Wanted Weapons of Fate? You shoot dudes. Yeah, that's it. It's a simple third-person linear shooter where you take the role of Wesley and his dad shortly after the events of the movie. It's pretty bare bones, but if you watch the movie, you'll get more out of it than if you haven't. The game's gimmick is curving the bullets where, like the movie, you can shoot bad guys behind cover by curving bullets that you earn by killing bad guys. It's basically a power meter in its implementation. There's nothing really else to say about the gameplay here since that's all that's there. You can watch the movie and beat the game in one afternoon. It's not the greatest game. It's kind of visually ugly, even for its time, with some bad screen time. But if you like the movie, pick this one up, considering how dirt cheap it is nowadays is. This is what started it all, and it feels wildly different than any modern Call of Duty, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, a lot of the mechanics do feel dated, and visually it doesn't hold up very well, but there is something somewhat charming about it all. It helped popularize the Iron Sights, which wasn't as common in 2003, and is a vital part of first-person shooters, and it's easy to forget that there was a time before them. As mentioned in the Big Red One review, this game has you play an unnamed soldier in the American, British, and Soviet Army. That's not necessarily a narrative, there's not necessarily a narrative per se, so it's the gameplay that keeps you going. But it's your standard World War II first-person shooter with all the weapons you'd expect from the area. They all sound fine, nothing too special, and that's likely because of the hardware it was originally developed for. It would be nice if the remaster had some more bells and whistles to modernize it a bit more, because in the end, it does feel dated even if it was a trendsetter in 2003. One thing I will note that it doesn't run very well on PS3 because the bad optimization considering Modern Warfare 2 came out the same year as this remaster and runs much better. It start, the start of the Soviet campaign in particular runs absolutely horrendously in the beginning as you're storming the beach and as there's a lot of AI around you, but I have to say it is still fun to play in 2019. This is my first VR game I got with my PSVR this year after trying out an Oculus Rift S in the storm and being blown away. This is a great first VR experience, even if it's mechanically very sparse and is more of an hour-long VR experience than a full-blown game. There are light detective mechanics with you trying to solve crime scenes and other puzzles in the city of Gotham. There's no combat like other Arkham games because it would be basically impossible to make a first-person Arkham combat system in VR without violently throwing up. But puzzles are all this game really needs to do. It's a beautiful game that makes you the Batman, and as Dunkey loves to say, it makes you feel like Batman. It's pretty amazing when you're standing on a ledge overlooking Gotham City in virtual reality. It's something that can't be explained and needs to be experienced to, to truly understand what it's like. It's absolutely mind-blowing how real it feels, even if the game is rather low-res on PSVR. The game is graphically impressive and seems to be using the same engine as Arkham Knight, so it is quite the looker even with the blurry image quality you get from the experience. My biggest complaint with the game is that I just wish there was more of it. At an hour long, it does feel more like a tech demo than anything else. It was intense being able to do different things with his hands and take different gadgets. Being able to look all around and use his gadgets, it really feels like you're Batman. Absolutely incredible. It was amazing. It felt so real. Awesome. Now I know this is definitely going to get some flack, I do like this game and I think it's pretty good, I just don't love it as much as everyone else. To start with the presentation, this game is just about perfect with an unbelievably charming art style that makes everyone and everything burst with tons of character. Even with the Switch's weak graphical capabilities, it is a sight to behold, easily one of the most visually striking games I've played this year. And music is also incredible with it being one of the best game soundtracks I've ever heard in my life. It's truly something to behold and even if you don't plan on playing the game, definitely at least listen to the soundtrack. It's an upbeat mix of multiple genres such as what seems like jazz sometimes and rock other times. It's very diverse and never gets old. Well, what I don't like here is the uh, gameplay. I'm not the biggest 2D platformer fan, so that will bias me in a negative way here, but I just didn't never want to play more than a level or two at a time. And sometimes it can be absolutely brutally difficult. Maybe the most challenging game this year. This is mostly because of the bosses, which again have great theme music and brilliant design, but are just unbearably challenging at times. Where I'd have to put the controller down and play again later. And when beating these bosses, I didn't feel much of an accomplishment. I was just happy to be done with it. I would still recommend this game to any fan of platform platforms because of how gorgeous it is. The cat 
If you wanted a game to test your relationship with your significant other, then here's the game for you. This is an isometric co-op cooking game that requires more communication to complete tasks than most modern military shooters. You'll need to work with your partner to know who exactly is doing what and when they're doing it. You'll be making calls when you see a modifier come into play like lava or when there's a new item for you to cook. This is also vital if you want to see the game to the end because you'll need to 3-star a lot of levels and once you finish the easy early levels, you'll need to master the much, much, much more challenging later levels. This game was absolutely brutal with my girlfriend as we were yelling at each other the whole time, but boy was it enjoyable. My girlfriend doesn't play games much, but still was not able to understand the game because of the controls and mechanics are so simple. You only use a few buttons to pick up items, move, and cut food. It's all very simple and non-gamers can pick it up easy, but to master it is a whole other beast. You'll frequently need to replay levels if you want to do good enough. There's no checkpoints in the game, which is understandable except for the last level in the game. It's 15 minutes long. It's one of the harder levels. If you fail, you'll have to play the whole level over and over again, which is fine when it's less than 5 minutes, but for most level, when it's over 15 minutes, it just gets tedious. Definitely one of my favorite call-up games this year. I don't think I've ever played a game that feels more like it came out in 2008 than Army of Two. From the shooting controls to the graphics to the animations, everything feels like a game from that era, which can be a good and bad thing. For the bad, it's visually all quite muddy, and textures are shockingly low res even for the time. The face masks, which have become a staple of the series in later games, look like blown up JPEGs here. And even if it was high res, it would still be all kind of boring, unlike later games which have a lot more options. There's no clip removed or reloading, which is a huge pet peeve for me. The story is also boring and forgettable, and I honestly can't remember anything about it other than the fact that the two main characters, Salem and Rios, are former army and now mercenaries. You're here for the gameplay though, and it's a lot better and holds up okay. It's not as good as Gears of War 1 or 2, which came out around the same time, but it still holds up. I would have to say that I was surprised at how competent the guns felt. I half expected them to feel loose and unenjoyable, but they are better than other games of the era, like the original Uncharted. There's a decent amount of customization, and it's really fun pimping out your gun with gold camo and as many attachments as possible. I also love the main character's designs, they just look badass. I think the second game is much better in most ways, and recommend playing that first, just because every aspect is improved in every single way. Salem! Uh -huh. Sorry, we were out kind of late last night. <laughs> What's your plan? This is a puzzle shooter action game that has you take the role of two convicts trying to get out of prison as you and a friend solve puzzles and shoot bad guys together. The game's camera is stuck in split screen whether you're playing couch co-op or over the internet co-op, and you do need to play with another person in the game. This is definitely unique to say the least, and there are a lot of mechanics that you've seen in other games but never thrown together like this. And you're never doing the same thing for too long either. The game is constantly switching up mechanics from driving to shooting to puzzle solving and so on. Even with all this variety in the gameplay, I just found it a bit boring. It wasn't bad, just not all that great. None of the mechanics are all that solid, the shooting isn't all that great, the driving is fine, and nothing's really special here. And this goes for everything in the game. There are points in the game where only one character is doing something enjoyable, and that means the other character is just performing boring, menial tasks or waiting for the other player to complete the actual fun task. The story, which is the main selling point of the game, doesn't get all that interesting until the end, and I do like the ending, which is a change depending on you and your partner's actions, actions in games. You know what I mean when you play this, and it's definitely an exciting moment knowing the ending can change depending on how you play it, and it's nice to see a game take place in the 1970s since very few games venture into this time period. This game is best played couch call in one sitting. We just arrived. Now if you look to the right again. We are travelers. Going miles through mud and muck. When people look back on this console generation, they're going to picture games like this, open world checkbox games, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just that we get a bit too much of it, and developers and publishers like to use this formula to pad out their games. This is the case with Wildlands, which has a ginormous map, one that's littered with things to do. Most of them are pretty boring to be honest and can get rather repetitive, which is the case for most elements in the game. You basically do the same thing for 35 hours, drive to the location, either stealth call enemies or go guns and blazing, destroy or find whatever objective is required and do it again and again. And this can be fun when there is some strategy on the higher difficulties, you need to know what you're getting into before going into a firefight, and you'll have to use all your available tools to get the job done, and you have to be smart about your loadout too, which is a good thing because the gun customization is amazing. There are so many guns, and you can customize them to a dizzying degree. I love when games do this like the newest COD. It makes the guns feel unique, however many of the guns are locked behind DLC loot boxes. Another aspect of the visuals I do enjoy are their environments, which are all varied, and there's unique forests to, to mountains to salt flies and everything in between. Every cartel member you take down has their own area, and it does help hide some of the more tedious aspects of the game when your environment is constantly changing. I'd recommend to play this on harder difficulties to force you to play a bit more tactically. Leaving no trace. We are scholars. Iron Marks. 
Blood and Truth is a VR first person shooter that's basically a Hollywood action movie with all the set pieces you'd expect from the genre, and you don't have full movement controls like other shooters on the platform, instead you can only really move ahead by looking at a couple possible cover locations and pressing a button to have your character automatically move there. It's definitely a bit nauseating at first, but after tweaking some settings and playing around a bit more I got used to it, and I quite liked it even though I would have preferred a mix of both automatic cover and full teleportation movement. The game feels restricted at moments because of it, and I understand why it is this way, but it is still annoying. The game is visually impressive too for what it's trying to do with a lot of explosions, detailed environments, and shockingly good characters. Character models. Now one issue with the visuals is how blurry it is. This is an issue with a lot of PSVR games, but it's pretty bad here with the hard to make on any text you'll have to read, and characters' faces looking great up close, but moving not even that far away, they're almost unrecognizable. My main issue with the game is two-handed weapons. Most of the game you are dual-wielding weapons, and it's a lot of fun with move controllers, where you have each gun in a hand. However, two-handed weapons are absolutely awful to use, and almost unusable. Trying to hold up two move controllers, one on the grip and one near the barrel, and trying to aim down sights is so frustrating, and this is an issue with a lot of PSVR games. Please, evidence. Anything will tell us. Somewhere in the I've played this on PS2, PSP, and 360 multiple times over the course of more than 10 years, and this is my favorite movie for younger me. It was the first FPS I ever played because my parents are very strict about violent video games. The game doesn't entirely follow the movie beat for beat, but does a good job of capturing the overall tone and story of the movie. It's a very immersive FPS that takes away all the HUD elements to provide a truly eerie experience on a mysterious skull island. You'll be going around the island with barely any ammo, trying to survive all manners of prehistoric creatures trying to kill you, which was a bold choice and worked out really well. The game is very linear and would have to be because of the lack of HUD, but at times it really does feel like a corridor shooter with the game not letting you venture off the beaten path all that much. This becomes an issue at times because you're on this large island but don't ever get to explore it. What really doesn't work all that well are the Kong sections. They're fine and all but the third person beat em up mechanics are pretty simple and honestly not all that enjoyable. It doesn't take up too much in the game but what I really remember about these awesome first person shooters areas, not the Kong sections. There are a few cool moments with the screen shaking as you roar and ripping apart of V-Rex's jaws which does give you an adrenaline rush but there are a lot of moments with you killing smaller enemies and doing some easy light platforming which brings the game down a bit. This is the best movie game I've ever played hands down no question. Sega. I know this game originally came out in 2010, but it looks great and easily runs at 1440p 60fps highest settings on a 1070. The game's art style is really great, and I love looking out to the horizon, which is basically a giant ring where everyone lives, think Elysium or the original Halo. Your character looks badass too and is constantly moving armor, and I love how all the guns seem to form and morph into different guns. Apart from the killer art style, the game also has great music, but a pretty generic story. There's some Russian bad guys who want to take over the world, and you have to stop them. It moves the gameplay along, and that's what matters. And now onto the best part of the gameplay. This may have the best third-person shooting mechanics of any game I've ever played. It's unbelievably fluid and fast. You you have a sliding ability where you go on your knees and slide around with the rocket boosters attached to them and then aiming and going to slow mode to take out target's weak spots. The game wants you to keep moving because staying in one spot is most certain death and the only time you're not moving fast is in between levels on a couple of spots where you're just defending a moving platform. These are the weakest points of the game because the fluid gameplay is not there, but they're short enough that it's not a big deal. I'd recommend this game to literally anyone who has ever once enjoyed a third person shooter because the mechanics are just so good and better than just about all of the competition. Welcome, my friend, and step right up to the ride of your life. This is definitely the scariest game I've ever played. When watching it, not in VR, it looks creepy and all, but not all that scary. But when you put a VR headset on and go into the world, it's just so terrifying. I actually scream while playing this game at multiple points. I occasionally enjoy hard games, but VR hard games are just as enticing as they are off-putting. I want to play more of them, but at the same time, I'm too scared to. The creepy, well-detailed de environments that you can only really see with a flashlight makes it feel like you're never in total control. Yeah, you have dual-wielding guns that can kill enemies, but sometimes you just can't get to them quick enough, and they scare the ever-living daylights out of you. One of the reasons for this is because of how good the game looks. The lighting, especially, is superb and is better than even most non-VR games. It looks shockingly realistic at times, even with the blurry visuals. The environments cover some hard bases like carnals, butchers, and caves. The roller coaster part of it is mostly to get you moving in a first person in a VR game without getting nauseous, and it works pretty well. When on a roller coaster, you're not moving your body. The coaster is, and it works in a similar way. There is also some moments in the game that embraces this roller coaster and has you going fast as hell around the track, and somehow you actually feel like you're on a roller coaster. For how great this game is, it's pretty short at only about two hours, and the replayability is mostly due to trying to get higher scores. Peggy 18.
This is the most badass game I've ever played, no question is asked. This game makes God of War 3 Kratos look like a bitch. He plays a demigod named Asura, beating up enemies as large as ethnic planets. It's so insane and gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. I'd get more into the story here, but I don't want to spoil it. It's very important as it's a very unique game that's more of an anime than an action game. There are episodes like a TV show and there are large gaps where you aren't playing or just hitting some QTEs. This may bore a lot of people because of the lack of interactivity, but I think it works just so damn well here. The story is very engaging, and while Asura can be a bit one-known at times, he basically has one emotion rage, it's more the events happening to Asura that are the most interesting. For a 2012 game, it looks great, and a lot of this is due to its art style. It's a mix of futuristic and old eastern designs, which merge so well. When you're not watching the game, you're playing it, and that's the weakest element. It's a standard third-person beat-em-up, with you locking onto enemies and beating the ever-living crap out of everything from demon monkeys to demon elephants to demigods. You basically end up hitting one button over and over again with the occasional special attack. It's not bad by any means, it just doesn't live up to the same standard as the rest of the game does. As much as I love this game, I can't say it's for everyone. If you don't really care about story and video games, or for someone who likes to skip past cutscenes, then this game isn't for you. Now into the worst game I've played this year. I had high hopes for this game as I like killing Floor 1 and 2 a decent amount with their meaty gunplay and heavy controls. I thought this would be the perfect fit for VR. And in the beginning of the game, I thought this was the case. I enjoyed myself killing zombies. However, once two-handed weapons came into play, it was just a shit show. It's so hard to aim with any two-handed weapons in the game with the exception of the pump-action shotgun, which really doesn't need to be aimed. The reason this game is so much worse for me than Blood and Truth when both games had bad two-handed weapons was because it was required for you in one level to use a sniper rifle to kill enemies from afar. No matter how much I move my camera, I could never get it to work properly. Aiming down sights was not impossible as the scope kept moving and after every shot you'd have to unchamber and chamber a new round, which is cool, but means you have to re-aim the gun, which is a pain in the ass. When you don't have to use two-handed weapons and can just use melee and a sidearm, it could definitely be fun with the zombies' limbs flying off depending on where you hit them. The weapons feel good with a few times they did work. There's a lot of punch to the gun that feels like you're actually hitting something with some good sound design and feedback the slain enemies give you. There's also some glitches in the game that put me outside the map and made me restart sections of the game because I couldn't get back into the play area. The only way I could recommend this game is if you skip the campaign completely and stick with the wave-based modes while also getting the game for dirt cheap because at full price I can't recommend it with the amount of issues I control. Have. This virus is mucking up everything. Any fading hope that our worlds have left to survive the coming darkness lies in your hands. If we want to survive this, this is a nice symmetric 4 player co op beat em up game where you fight countless enemies as you progress your way through the story, which is just generic Marvel fluff with you fighting Thanos for the Infinity Stones, not unlike the movies in some way. There's nothing too special here, and it's not like you're gonna get attached to any characters that you weren't a fan of before, but it gets the job done. There's just twist near the end of the game that anyone can see from a mile away, which is a bit annoying. Now, the gameplay is where multiple Marvel Ultimate Alliance shines. You have a standard light and heavy attack, and also four special attacks for each hero, and all 36 heroes have their own unique specials, and can be comboed together for even greater damage. The combo here, combat here is very satisfying, if a bit easy, with the exception of some of the bosses. All the attacks from punch to kicks to guns and spells all have a real weight to them. The real challenge comes from rifts, which are modified areas of the game you've already played with some more difficulty. Now I do like this and played it a bunch, but it's a bit obnoxious that Thanos is locked behind the final one, which is absolutely painful to get through. The performance isn't all that great either and gets lower than I've ever seen a game get on Switch when all the abilities are active. The visuals also aren't all that great, and while the cartoon art style hides a lot of this, it just isn't all that detailed or pretty. Finally, I don't like that the crystals you can add to characters to give them small buffs, I just think it's unnecessarily cumbersome and complex. Death always prevails. I have waited so long for this. We will. I was pleasantly surprised with this game. It's almost like a better, more condensed version of No Man's Sky with some Ubisoft open world mechanics. You fly around on a spaceship that you can customize with different weapons and pilots as you fly around the galaxy, shooting enemies and saving the galaxy. The shooting is pretty fun and the guns have weight behind them, and you have to think about which weapons are weak against what enemies. You can combine weapons too to increase what damage you're going to do. What I don't like is that the game gives you three weapons, but there are more weapon types than that, so you'll be missing out on some combinations of weaknesses. You can still beat the game, but it's just a bit more challenging. The game also has a pretty cool art style with the planets looking distinct and being fun to explore. There's everything from ice planets to fire planets and a lot in between. What I like is that there's a set number of planets, unlike No Man's Sky, where a lot of the planets feel similar, because, but here they're all different. They all do have the same structures and enemies, but the landscapes are unique. You can also explore space and fly your ship from planet to planet without any loading screen, which is cool. And there's some fun, simple space combat that relies a bit too much on auto-locking enemies. I love this game as that it's split screen, and it's very fun with a friend as you two are constantly swapping ships and weapons. It's very strange that there's no online, which does stink, and I think that this might be the most fun I've had in Couch Co-op in a while. There is a story here, but it feels like a generic Saturday morning cartoon, which is fine considering the target demographic is kids. The number one killer is time. 
it destroys. This is a unique game that takes a risk, and I'll give them credit there. This is due to the use of live action TV episodes, splitting up each chapter in the game. They're about 25 minutes long each, and this is the biggest issue for me. I found these wholly unenjoyable. The acting isn't great, with the exception of some of the big name actors. It feels like a low budget CW show with poor lighting, boring action scenes, uninteresting dialogue, and tons of Nissan product placements. The only reason I didn't skip these is because they're vital to the story, but in reality, I don't remember it all that well, and I didn't even beat it that long ago. I just know there's some confusing time travel jargon. The game is visually very impressive and has some fantastic looking effects and very detailed character models, but even, even this is marred by the use of down downscaling techniques that needs to be implemented if you want an acceptable frame rate. The game runs so poorly it's hard to fathom at times. I've been shitting on this a lot now, but one aspect I do really like is the actual gameplay. Actually running around using time powers to defeat enemies is exhilarating. You'll have to use different abilities on all the types of enemies such as putting up time shields to get past a sniper, or slowing down a heavy to get behind it to its weak spot. I love Remedy and I want to see them succeed, but this game annoyed me so much with it barely running at acceptable settings to the obnoxious poorly done TV episodes. This game has some serious flaws. Hello, planet Earth. I'm Eva Tyson, and joining me is one of my colleagues, Dr. Grant Moon. Hi. There's a lot to like here with fun shooting, especially with a light gun as it fixes all the issues with two-handed weapons that I had with other VR shooters. The guns feel punchy and it feels great ducking and dodging trying to get into the cover on this alien orb. However, once I got to the end of the game, I was really looking forward to it to be over. While the game isn't that long, it basically has one brown environment for the entire game and it gets old quick. More environmental variety would help this game out a lot as you can only take cover behind the same brown rock before you start to get bored no matter how fun the gameplay is. The enemies all come at you from the front, so if you're using the more accommodating comfort modes, you'll never have to worry about turning around to shoot an enemy. The enemies also have a nice variety with you, hitting all the shooter tropes such as small enemies that come in packs, long range ones, rushes, etc. Other than the boring environments, the other uninspired part for me was the story. I don't want to spoil anything and I've never felt a connection to any either of the main two characters whose journey you watch play out since you're trying to find out what happened to them. It does take some interesting twists and turns, and the intro sequence is amazing, but every time there's a cutscene, I always want to get back into the gameplay, because that was where the real fun was. If you have a PSVR light gun, I would highly recommend this game. What? They've had time to breathe. Even all these years later, Gears of War is better than just about all the competition in terms of its raw cover and shooting mechanics. This is a remake of the original 2006 release with some nice visual enhancements and about 90 minutes of new campaign gameplay. I really like Gears of War campaigns, this is a great entry in the series that holds up incredibly well. The guns still pack a hell of a punch. There's not a ton of variety in the guns though, and I, that's, I was, but I was entirely content using just the Lancer and Nash for most of the game because of how good they feel. The only other issue I have is with the animation for the chainsaw, which was glitched out for the entire game, so anytime I went for an attack, the animation would play out too far away from the enemy, so they would be teared in half without the actual team chainsaw touching them. This game excels at atmosphere, the game's color palette is very muted and there's a lot of grays and browns, but in other games where it would be boring, here it works really well to instill a sense of dread that wouldn't be possible if in a bright world. The story here is fine with you trying to stop the locust horde, but that's not really what sticks out to me with this game. The character is what I really ended up caring for. The four-man squad including Dom, Marcus, Coltrane, and Beard are all likable meaty protagonists without neck because they're just so damn jacked. And while they do look like meatheads and act like it sometimes too, they're a lot more likable than they may originally appear. This game truly is a masterpiece, other than some glitches I experienced in this version of the game. It is truly fantastic, and this is my fourth time completing it too. If you haven't played it before, you take the role of Joel, taking this girl Ellie across the United States in a post-apocalyptic zombie setting. I don't want to get too deep here, but you need to play the game for yourself. It is one of the greatest video game stories ever told, and puts about just about every other game to shame. While most games would have a brown aesthetic for a post-apocalyptic world, this game is full of color, with nature taking back the world, meaning that there's tons of bright greens as plant life engulfs the city that once stood. Even though it came out in 2013, it looks fantastic from a technical standpoint, which is something you can't say of many games released around that time. The phases in particular here are fantastic and full of emotion. The game plays where most people have their criticisms, but I think it plays really well with you having limited ammo as you try to avoid combat to conserve ammo and supplies when you need it most. The gunplay feels solid too with all your shots packing a punch and that could tear enemies apart in a brutal fashion, and this game making you feel uncomfortable with the violence. Some of it hard to stomach, but it serves the story well as it makes the wheel feel real without being over the top. You don't really want to kill, but you must to survive. I would recommend playing on harder difficulty as it forces you to slow down and be deliberate with every action where mistakes can mean sudden deaths. This is truly a masterpiece
In Concrete Genie, he plays a bullied boy painting scenes that come to life on walls and creating these monstrous called genies to help you along the way and solve some puzzles. What I love about this game is how it tells you to create a scene with maybe some grass and trees but doesn't go into specifics. And you don't just draw grass with some lines, the game gives you a template to work with. So you'll choose the grass option as you brush from across the screen, grass populates the area and this is the same for all items in the game. You don't start out with much to work with but as you get further into the game it opens up a bit and allows you to start mixing and matching a lot more. Same goes for the genies you create where you start with a template and then add features. It's not a huge amount of customization but it's enough to get the job done. That's the main gameplay element and it's nice to see a game that's not about violence though near the very end they do add some combat mechanics which aren't very enjoyable and I don't think add to the overall experience. The game takes place in a fishing time which is an interesting setting you don't see much in games. One gripe I do have is with the stealth mechanics since there are a band of bullies wandering around and if they see you they'll run after you and throw you in a trash can. It doesn't put you back much and they aren't destroying your art so it feels more like a nuisance than anything else. What I like so much about Concrete Genie is that I've never really played a game like it before and it's a nice change of pace when playing so many shooters in open world games. Twenty years of civil war. You know, there's nothing civil about it. I have to say, this is one of the better Call of Duty campaigns I've played. It takes a very authentic approach to the campaign and makes it feel as though you're using tactics as a special ops soldier to take down your enemies. Now, this usually is very scripted and not in your control, which I do feel is a downside, but fairly common in Call of Duty games. There are a lot of points in the game where you can't proceed unless an ally does so first, which is cool for a bit and makes it feel a bit more tactical, but once you try to move away from the very strict path the game wants you to go down, the facade fades away. I know all Call of Duty stories are very linear in nature, but at times it feels a bit too much here and does take away from the sense of immersion the game tries to portray. There's a very specific mission in the game that opens up the map a bit and allows you to choose how to play, and because of it, it becomes one of the best levels in the game. It's not to say that any of the more scripted levels aren't fun. They can be at times as a clean house, where you go through a house with other British special forces clearing any room. Yes, it's very linear and scripted, but it does manage to be fun the first time around. There's also this one level in particular, particular where you play as a child, and I find it wholly unenjoyable. You have to stealth around, and it's just not very fun, and also somehow manages to introduce a boss fight, which is also pretty boring. One other element of the game I have to mention is the story and writing, which all kind of boils down to overly dramatic military tropes. Soldiers, you train This is a game where if you think the trailer looks cool, you're almost definitely going to like the game. It's a third person action game where you slice and dice literally tens of thousands of enemies with single attacks killing dozens at once. I'm only going to be talking about the Legends mode here because I didn't really have any desire to play Adventure Mode or Challenge Modes, just know that when listening to my criticisms and how our warriors will be drafted in a map and allow objectives from kill this enemy to defend this ally and so on. The gameplay isn't very complex, so it's not trying to be either, and it works because of it. Your two main attacks are just light and heavy that can be strung together for some combos, but where the depth comes in is how many different characters there are. They all play pretty differently from one another, and part of the fun is just trying new characters to see their movesets. There's 30 of them from all different Legend of Zelda games, and a lot are unlocked from the start and the more you play the more you unlock. While I do like this in some aspects, it also means the best strategy is sticking with as few characters as possible to level them up and forget about everyone else. Another thing I don't like is the one objective type where you have to defend a person or area. They're fine by themselves but usually put with other objectives it means you'll have to basically babysit them and have to check up on them while completing other objectives. I can't tell you how many times I failed a mission because a useless NPC died. One part of the game I definitely didn't care for was the story, it was very anime, I didn't seem to have any purpose. If you want a mindless game just to kill unspeakable amounts of enemies then this game is for you and there's a lot here for you too. You play Sam Porter Bridges, a del glorified delivery man in this odd post-apocalyptic America. This is Pete Kojima writing, and you'll know what I'm talking about if you've ever played any Metal Gear Solid game before. There's a whole lot of exposition and loads of very long cutscenes. If you like to skip cutscenes or just tolerate them, I probably wouldn't recommend it because you won't understand what's going on, and it's already very confusing if you're paying attention. But as for the gameplay, this is where I fell in love with the game. It's very slow and methodical, with you delivering packages across very rough terrain. Kojima makes it so the act of walking is a gameplay mechanic, and you're watching your step and trying to bounce yourself so you don't have to drop your cargo. The point of this is game is to bring America back together after the death training event, and also involves building structures such as highways and shelters to help. Other players on your journey, and on your travels, you have to avoid these ghosts or things that you can't see called BTs, which are the game's primary enemies, and these enemies called mules, which are just other humans trying to steal your cargo. Avoiding and fighting these guys where the other half of the gameplay comes into play. I didn't like this mechanic in the beginning because they kept on capturing me, but by the end, I actually liked it and it added a lot of tension. The mules, however, are pretty boring to fight because the melee mechanics in the beginning are pretty dull, and by the end, the shooting mechanics you have aren't very good. It's a very unique game, and you don't see that much in the AAA space that, any, that much anymore, and I have to give them credit just for that. I'll stay.
I'm surprised at how good this game is, even with its many issues. The game feels great to play with lightsaber swings, packing the sort of punch I wouldn't expect from a first-time effort. When you cut enemies in half, you sort of get a power trip, but that's only for non-human enemies, as human enemies can't be dismembered, and now it's disappointing considering the Force only had it nine years ago. The game is slower than most third-person action games, and it's more on the level of Bloodborne. Yes, you can get aggressive, but you must be careful since some of the enemies are quite deadly and can mess you up. Some of the bosses specifically were brutal and had me restarting over and over again on the second highest difficulty. While that was annoying, once I mastered pairing, I began to take down these bosses. The game also takes another page from the Souls games in that enemies respawn after meditating or dying, but unlike those games, there doesn't seem to be any reason. It seems like they wanted this mechanic, but didn't know how to incorporate it narratively. The story is solid, with some excellent performances really taking it up a notch. It takes some dark turns that I liked, but I found the ending to be kind of boring and safe. I would have, would have preferred a bolder ending. Now into the bad, the game is glitchy as all hell. I've fallen through the world so many damn times, and I had to quit the game to get out of dying sometimes as I'd respawn outside the play area. Many times enemies wouldn't load, and I'd run through an empty area that had sectors popped again, and it really felt rushed. I would sprint most places, and if you sprint, there's a good possibility the world won't load properly, and you'll fall through, and then wait almost another minute to load back in. Within. This game started out pretty poorly for me and I almost quit before finishing the first level, but after a while I couldn't stop thinking about it and had to put it back in. This is because of the horrendous simple lag and really bad frame rate. While the game does feel heavy on purpose, the latency just makes it feel like you're walking through sludge and makes aiming way harder than it should be. The frame rate also doesn't hold up at all and is constantly dipping below 30 FPS, and on top of all that, there's just way too much motion blur. Put these all together and I hated it at first, but I just couldn't stop thinking about it after putting it down for a day. So I got back in the game the next day and quite enjoyed my time. Yeah, all those issues definitely hampered my experience, but the atmosphere and eventually fun shooting kept me coming back. The shooting takes some getting used to, but once you do, bolts have a lot of impact and the hell gets wrecked to every bolt you shoot at them. It does take a lot of bolts to kill because these guys are bullet sponges if I've ever seen one. The game plays best at close range because once you start getting to medium to long range, the guns are just too inaccurate and the enemies take too many bolts to kill. Luckily, the game does not have too many long range gunfights, so it's not so bad, and when there is one, they usually give you a sniper, making things a bit easier. And for the story, I didn't care at all. Yeah, the hell guys are cool enemies, but that's about it, and I really couldn't care any less about the protagonist or antagonist. What does hold up is the graphics and the art style. This game came out in 2009 and still looks good and is one of the best looking games on PS3 today. Peggy 12. Does the color of the sky mean anything? I'm not a huge fan of flight games, but this game made me one. It's a mix of arcade and simulation mechanics that made for a truly exhilarating experience. Even with the very little time I have with the genre, it was very easy to pick up, and there's clearly a lot more to learn. Going to dogfights thousands of feet in the air or bombing targets on the ground are equally as fun. Dodging missiles and weaving around the air to finally destroy that target who's been on you the past five minutes is so rewarding. The game is also visually very impressive, too, even if it only runs at 1080p on the PS4 Pro, but the 60fps gameplay makes everything feel so smooth. Visually, the game is so impressive, especially the volumetric clouds, which adds so much life to the game world. I rarely watch replays in games, but this game looks like a movie at times, and it's genuinely fun to watch replays of you blowing everything up from different angles. The ground textures aren't the greatest, but it's standard for this genre and doesn't take away much from the game. What does take a bit away from the game is the story, which is just so dull and has these overly boring, long cutscenes. I would recommend just skipping these because of how boring they are. I never cared for a single character, and they're overly drawn out monologuing. One aspect of the gameplay I didn't care for were the checkpoints, which were a bit too spread out, and restarting 15 minutes of gameplay over and over again isn't all that much fun. Even if you're not a fan of this genre, I would recommend checking this one out. Yep. In just about every aspect, I think this game is better than Killzone 2. From the variety in the environments to the feel of the game, everything seems improved. The first thing I'll notice when playing this game is that it feels so much better to control. The input latency has improved quite a bit and the frame rate is much more consistent, though still not the greatest. Where in Killzone 2, you're in one environment basically the whole game. Here, you'll be in more torn zones, to lush alien worlds, and a lot more. It doesn't have the same gritty feel of the previous games because of this, but I think that can be a good thing as another brown and gray shooter would be a bit too much, though I can understand why some people would prefer the previous game's art style more. One thing I did enjoy much more was the Story here, and specifically when the game takes the perspective of the Hellgast. I found their conflict amongst the ranks to be rather intriguing, it was much more enjoyable than the ISA storyline, which isn't all that memorable. Grill Games does a great job with the weapon design here, and it's better than ever, and I love all the different ways to kill enemies, from the punchy sniper rifles to the laser cannon-like weapons that explode enemies. This game is still very linear, and I think it would have improved a bit if it was opened up a bit more, though I understand tactical constraints probably wouldn't have allowed it. A fun, if a bit short FPS, that'll take you about one or two sittings to complete. Where are the eyes? They're going to command. Proceeding to a great territory. No. 
This is a pretty standard first person shooter from 2008 and I know a lot of people love this game but I found it to be a bit dull. I much prefer Resistance 3 to this. You take the role of Nathan Hale, a soldier infected with the Chimeran virus as you grow across the world trying to stop the Chimeran threat. There are a lot of cool set pieces in this game but overall I don't think it holds up all that well. The shooting feels average at best with some cooler weapon design as Insomniac is known for helping make up for it a bit such as the auger which is basically a gun with wall hacks. The gameplay here is really where the game suffers, it just feels so inconsistent you'll constantly be dying and not knowing why, one moment you'll have full health and the next you'll be dead for seemingly no reason. This is very frustrating as you never felt in control of the game since your death has never felt your fault. Graphically speaking, the game isn't all that great either. It came out in 2008 and there's just so many better looking games for the time such as World at War and Halo 3. There's a story here and it does the job to get you from place to place, but other than that, it doesn't really tell that compelling of a story. I do love the premise of the game, but it all feels like it could have been a lot better, which is why I think Resistance 3 is the superior game because of how it fixes just about every problem this game has. Welcome to World War Z, a third-person shooter based on the hit Paramount film pitting you and your friends against countless hordes of zombies. This game is basically Left 4 Dead in third person, and I think, while a little unoriginal, it does what it set out, sets out to do pretty well. The main gimmick of the game that separates it from other zombie games is the giant hordes you face off against. You'll be setting up your defenses when a giant swarm of seemingly hundreds of zombies come pouring out of buildings, and it is a sight to behold. It's something you need to experience for yourself, as it is one of the most memorable gaming moments this year. Other than this, the game doesn't really do anything new, but what it does do, it set, does pretty well. Other than the story, which is fairly non-existent, the gun gunplay feels pretty good for a third person shooter, and there's a decent amount of guns you level up through playing the game, and I loved unlocking new variants of guns unlocked to try in the game. There's also a lot of classes which helps to differentiate it from Left 4 Dead and these help to make the gameplay feel a bit more dynamic because on the harder levels you'll need to coordinate with your teammates if you want to succeed. To upgrade the classes and guns you'll need to earn credits from playing the game and it's nice to play a modern game that doesn't feel like a grind. Everything is fairly easily obtained and it just takes a bit of playing around to level up. One other positive are the locations which are variety and have nice details. If you're like me and waiting for Left 4 Dead 3 then maybe give this game a shot if there's still an active community playing it. Just around the corner. All-star roster of Mario this is the last game I beat this year and it was incredibly frustrating. I really wanted to like this one and in some regards I did. The moment to moment tennis gameplay is very solid. It's just a lot of inconsistencies that bring this game down for me. This mostly had to do with the difficulty in the game which is all over the place. First we'll be playing a level no more than once to get through it and then out of nowhere the opponents get incredibly challenging and rage inducing. Even the final boss of this game wasn't all that hard. Random enemies in the middle of the game were much more challenging for me like boom boom. They feel really cheap at times with seemingly almost impossible to beat some of these guys with their insane speed. When I wasn't serving on some of the harder levels I would just let them hit past me because I knew I wouldn't be able to defend myself otherwise. The adventure mode is somewhat fun otherwise, and if you're good you can probably beat it in a handful of hours, which isn't all that great considering most Nintendo games stay full priced. When you're not enraged, there's some fun to be had, and I think the arcade tennis gameplay is fun, but I think I would stick to playing solo matches or just playing with a friend. It'd be a lot better without a lot of the BS experienced in the story. There aren't many tennis games out there, and be, let alone arcadey ones, so if you are looking to play one, then maybe wait for a sale because there is still some fun to Send be had. Send the ball crashing down. If you've made it this far, I gotta say, I am kind of surprised. I uh, I kind of just made this out of the blue. I was thinking about it for a while. I bought a microphone and wanted to see what it would be like to make this video. And this was a lot harder than I thought it would be. I wrote these reviews months back, and now that I had to actually read them out, which I was kind of putting off because I don't like the sound of my own voice, I, I, I realized that it is a lot harder to record and read scripts than I originally thought. As you could hear in some of the ones around the middle, I was just having to go through them as fast as humanly possible because I wrote so much and it's it's a lot harder than it may seem to write a whole bunch of reviews and only make them 60 seconds each but I, I'd, I'd say it was kind of fun and I might do this some more maybe with some uh, maybe like the movies I watched in 2019 maybe I'll make it a bit less scripted so I don't have the same constraints that I had with this one and maybe from now on I might review games as I play them I'm currently playing Gears of War 5 and that's pretty fun and but I'll probably beat that in early 2020 sometime beginning of January but if, if you guys want more of this uh, just let me know and put it in the comments and I think I might do some more of this just with a bunch of different stuff like uh, movies and maybe even music and games uh, I'm a big fan of people like the Cosmo Variety Hour and I was kind of hoping to make something like that where I'm not stuck to one subject I can talk about really whatever I, I like here but I don't know I just wanted to make a video about this and I thought it'd be pretty fun so I hope you like this and if you got this far well I gotta say I'm surprised because I don't even know if I would make it this far.